Welcome to Lock and Key Unlocked, a podcast about Joe Hill and Gabriel Rodriguez's comic book Lock and Key and the Netflix series that is coming real soon. I'm Alex. I'm Justin. I'm Pete. And this is the first official episode of our Lock and Key podcast. We're going to be talking about the first volume of the comic book series, Welcome to Lovecraft, as we lead into the Netflix series. Now, just a word of warning here. We are going to be talking Ooh. about spoilers. Ooh, warning. Comic- well, beware. Warning. Just, it's like a pack of cigarettes. Just I'm saying be careful. That's all. Yeah. Just we are. watch yourselves. We're edgy. We're bad. We're bad boys. We're bad for your health. But the kind and, of thing where you're like, ooh, I want that. And what is better than being very careful not to spoil people at a comic book that came oh. out in 2008? You know what mm. I'm talking about? Yeah. The ultimate bad boys never spoil. That's yeah. what my tattoo says. Do you remember when the Fonz <laughs> back at Happy Days was about to hit the jukebox and he was like, hey, spoiler alert, three, two, one. And then he'd hit it and the jukebox would turn on. Well, he didn't want to spoil the latest jam. <laughs> Someone was just w- listening along at home to their album, song by song. He didn't want to jump to song 11. Yeah, that's how he's like Paddington, who also doesn't want to spoil the latest jam. What? <laughs> uh, what sorry, references? Sir. You're all... <laughs> Excuse me, Dad. I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> I've been... You just listen, from... we're taping this over the holidays. I've been hanging out with my kids a lot. Let's get in and Woo! talk about Welcome to Lovecraft. Now, uh, we are going to be talking about the book, but... This is spoilers for the book. It's not necessarily spoilers for the TV series, which is, as far as we know, going to take its own path, remix things, change things a little bit. So think of it more as a primer, a prep, if you will, getting ready for the TV show itself. A little trip to prep school. The crib notes is what this is. We're cheating on the test, and the test is lock and key, and you guys are going to pass and then go to jail. You know what? Just fill in all A's on the bubbles, and you're going to have a good chance there. Yep, no, classic Scantron no. stuff. All C's. We're young and fresh. All you C's? And all C's? Is that what you do? Yeah, yeah. No, I got all A's because that's what I want, yo. <laughs> that's nice. I'd fill in all the bubbles and let God sort them out. Wow. <laughs> I love that bumper sticker, by the way. <laughs> yeah, it's right there. I have a tattoo on my back and then a bumper sticker on my ass. Wow. Now, before we get into the book proper, let's talk about a little history of uh, Lock and Key. I think uh, this is interesting to know, but it's also kind of important to know to understand the world, the way it was when this book came out. Now, (laughs) 9-11 had been seven years earlier. No, (laughs) Alex, no. No, don't do that. Okay, so uh, Lock and Key, written by Joe Hill, art by Gabriel Rodriguez, as we mentioned, colors by Jay Photos, letters by Robbie Robbins. It was edited by Chris Ryle. I'll remember that name in a little bit, in a second, because he becomes very important. But the book, when it was released, February 20th, 2008, sold out in a single day. Uh, this isn't Oof. necessarily a complete rarity for comic books, but it was a big deal because it showed the amount of hype that was behind this book, particularly from two main creators who weren't quite as well known in the comic book space. For it Joe took Hill, me years to sell out, so it's really nice that they <laughs> went right yeah. for it. Oh By the way, God. congratulations. You finally reached, what was it, the New York Trimes bestseller list? That's exactly right. No, and, you're uh, just a sellout. Ooh. Yeah. So Joe Hill had published two books at this point, 20th Century Ghosts in 2005, which was a short story collection, Heart Shaped Box, his first novel in 2007. Now, the other thing about Joe Hill that you should probably know, or you may know already, is he is the son of Stephen King and Tabitha King. Stephen King and Tabitha King, obviously two very famous horror writers. Uh, And Joe took, I believe it's his middle name and also his mom's maiden name, Hill, because he didn't want to be associated with Stephen King. He didn't want to just ride on his dad's name into his career as a horror writer. He knew he would have comparisons with him, and so he decided to forge his own career. He had published short stories, kind of cold submitted them for a while, and eventually built it up to the point that Heart Shaped Box I believe hit number eight on the New York Times bestseller list. Uh, So he made his name on himself, but he wasn't a huge deal. He wasn't a big bestseller across the board. I I actually did the same thing in the podcasting world. My real name is uh, Justin Mark Marin. <laughs> oh, what the fuck? I never told you that. What <laughs> yeah, the fuck? Exactly. That's what I said a lot Unbelievable. growing up. But, spoiler, that's my dad. I changed my name to Tyler because I wanted uh, more first names. 
Yeah, that's <laughs> weird because my name is actually really Alexander This American Life. <laughs> wow. Uh, that's Who, true. He's the host of that show, I believe? Yep, that's why it's called that. The Great. titular name of the show. Yeah. Uh, titular host. Um, this American Life. So Joe Hill, uh, at that point, had been scripting and working on a comic book called Lock and Key. You might be familiar with it. He had some notes and ideas for the story, uh, and it ended up talking to IDW, the publisher, about it. Jump back a little bit. You got Gabriel Rodriguez, the artist. He hadn't exactly been able to make it work as a comic book artist in Chile because there wasn't a very big scene there. So as all comic book artists do, he fell back on his second career being an architect. Uh. Uh, yeah, Classic. that's why so many buildings have Spider Men uh, outside of them <laughs> when they're built. <laughs> yeah, what? you can look them. It's like secret Mickey's at Disney World, but Spider Man in every building. Yeah, it's uh, yeah. Pay attention. Look, Pete. Look around the city and see what you see. There's a lot of great architecture and a lot of great superheroes just waiting for you to discover them. And if wow. I might add, Pete, stop walking around looking at your phone. You know, just look up more. Just enjoy the world. Oh, you know? that's very ironic coming from you. No, man. I threw away my phone years ago. <laughs> Alex walks so, around Brooklyn with an Oculus Rift on, screaming about <laughs> shapes. <laughs> so Gabriel Rodriguez uh, was working as an architect at the same time. He uh, still got his comic book chops working by drawing a few trading card games, I believe, in Chile specifically. And off of that, he got hired by IDW to draw, of all things, CSI comics. Oh, which my, favorite. Favorite. Yeah. my favorite format for the show is is um, the comic book form. Yes. Yeah, and what's great is every single comic w- ended with the last panel of him just putting glasses on. That's, oh. uh, listen, man, I don't want to get all <laughs> up on your nuts about CSI, but that's CSI Miami. Oh, Pete, how dare you? The the uh, the redheaded stepchild of the CSI series. How dare ironically. you say it's the redheaded stepchild? CSI Miami is the NCIS <laughs> of NBC, Pete. <laughs> <laughs> you don't it's even not... know what you said. <laughs> Justin, <laughs> CSI is not on NBC. It's on CBS. I, I, listen, I'm sorry. I can't get into this. This is for my CSI podcast, which I host with my dad, This American Life. Oh. Uh, we talk <laughs> about this all the time, and you're not a welcome on. Oh, wow. Well, I do feel bad because the C in NCIS is for CBS. Is that right? <laughs> uh, yes, the S stands for CSI. Oh, wow. It's all one show, man. Nice. Uh, that's what it actually stands for, is nice CSI, and then they mixed around the letters a little bit. <laughs> it's just kinder, more uh, <laughs> gentler CSI. So he did work on these CSI comics. They did pretty well. He developed a relationship with IDW, and when Joe Hill gave his outline for Lock and Key to Chris Ryle, Chris Ryle said, hey, we have this great artist called Gray Bill Rodriguez. Why don't you talk to him? And from there, they basically became inseparable. Uh, They were the team working on Lock and Key, and that all led up to the first issue selling out, as we mentioned, on February 20th, 2008. Now, the first volume that we're going to be talking about in this podcast is called Welcome to Lovecraft. That's the first six issues. Welcome to Lovecraft and the second volume, Head Games, are considered act one of the book, of three acts in the book. Uh, That said... To transition into talking about the book proper, what I was so fascinated to revisit this now, and I've read the book a couple of times, but it has been a couple of years since I checked it out, is I was surprised to rediscover what a complete story this volume is. Oh, yeah. Also, uh, how dare you, Zelvin? I read it every February 20th, uh, reread it every <laughs> year, and it keeps mm-hmm. getting better every time I read it. Why uh, classic uh, Beatles why do you do reaction? Because that? that's the day it sold out. Oh wow! Huh? L- okay. He literally just finished. Do you listen to Zalbin when he's talking? Or yeah, no, I hear the whole thing. It's just <laughs> weird. You reread it on the day it sold out. Yeah, yeah. It's called sellout day, and Pete's the biggest sellout I know. Oh, you watch your mouth, Zalbin. So I want to ask you guys before we get into the plot or talk about the book in particular, uh, did you have any big reactions from checking it out again? Anything that struck you in particular about the book? I mean, just what uh, it's such a different type of comic, like the especially the first issue. um, And we'll get into this in a minute, I bet. But it's uh, they tell a story in such an odd, unique way. And the fact that it's sort of a um, a three part 
there are three main characters, and we get each of their perspectives in this first series. It's just really, really different, and the art uh, is so great, but also specific uh, to the to the sh- to the series. And I got to say, rereading it, I'd forgotten a lot of the early details, so it was great uh, to mm-hmm. to get back into it. I was really surprised that how well, uh, how fast you get into it. And then how quickly they kind of show you what the comic is about and what's going to kind of unfold. It's a really great, uh, I didn't remember like how quickly they were like, hey, this is our world. This is what's happening. Mm-hmm. Uh, if you like this, you're going to have the best time ever. You know, uh, I really wow. appreciate that going <laughs> back and ever. reading it. Man. I think it's an amazing story. No, we're not disagreeing with you. It's just that's a bold statement to say the best time ever. Okay, well, uh, as far as comics and storytelling and art. Yeah, have you ever been on a roller coaster, Pete? (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Have you ever had sex? Oh, have you ever had sex on a roller coaster? Because that's (laughs) fucking crazy, dude. It's crazy. Every February 20th, after Pete is done rereading Lock and Key, he goes and has sex on a roller coaster. And he's like, not as good, bro. Not as good. Yeah. Rereading that volume was better than the <laughs> sex I just had on this wooden roller coaster called the Cyclone. <laughs> shout out to the Cyclone. Yeah, yeah, shout out to the Brooklyn's famous roller coaster, the Cyclone. An all wood roller coaster that seems like it should be shut down by at this point. <laughs> Coney Island, more like Bodie Island. Know what oh, I'm talking about? That's what I'm talking about. That's actually so, what a lot of people there are talking about, Alex. Oh, are they? Yep. Oh, you should I'm check it out there for the delicious Nathan's hot dogs that you can't get anywhere else. <laughs> oh, those are so super delicious is the word people say the most on Coney Island. <laughs> now, uh, this doesn't take place on Coney Island. In fact, it takes place in uh, mostly in a town called Lovecraft, Massachusetts. Uh, in the TV show, just a little note, it's going to be called Matheson, Massachusetts, and I can't help but think that's because H.P. Lovecraft has gotten a little bit of a reassessment over time. I'm sure we'll talk about that more when we get to the show proper. Um, but let's, let me give a broad overview of the plot, and then we can jump in and out and talk about specific things and the issues. So this takes place after a man, uh, not a man, a kid, a teen named Sam Lesser, kills a guy named Rendell Locke in front of his entire family. They eventually stop him and the guy that he is working with, who is attacking their family. It's essentially a home invasion. Uh, And to try to repair their lives and their family, they move to Rendell Locke's old house called Key House, up in this town of Lovecraft, Massachusetts. Now, the main characters that we're following, uh, Nina Locke is the mother, Kinsey Locke is the oldest daughter, Tyler Locke is the oldest son, and uh, Bodie Locke is the youngest son. He's much younger than the other two. The other two are teens. He's, I don't know, how old is he? Like eight or nine or something like that? Yeah, I think that's right. Yeah, I mean, You guys have kids. Come on, you should be able to tell. Uh, it's hard to tell. Yeah, I'll tell you what. My kids, not actually comic book characters, so... There you go. No, oh. Alex, one of your kids is a comic book character. Yeah. Is that true? I mean, come on, man. Oh, yeah. man. Which the one? one? Who- no, don't tell me. I know which one. I know which one. <laughs> yeah. yeah, you do. I'm glad. <laughs> Uh, so they move up <laughs> to this house and very quickly they encounter a couple of things. First of all, they uh, very slowly find out the things... With their father, with Rendell Locke, his history with the town of Lovecraft may go a lot deeper than they thought it did. Uh, Also, Bodie encounters a mysterious being who lives in the well, in the well house just outside of the main home. Uh, It's a lady who's trapped in the well, and she is after the thing that Bodie starts to discover very quickly is hidden throughout the house, which is these mysterious keys for the title. And Mm. each key has a different ability. The ones that we encounter in the first volume, the main one is the ghost key, which unlocks a door, and if you step through the door, you turn into a ghost. You can use your ghost powers to concentrate on things and people and end up immediately there. Also, the ghost can re-enter your body, assumably as long as the body is still alive. Uh, The other one that we learn about is the Anywhere key that allows you to go anywhere by opening a door. Uh, And I think uh, there's a couple of other keys we kind of see, but we don't really find out about throughout the volume, right? Yeah. Uh, yeah, there's the the gender swap key, um, right? Which I forget the yeah. name of it. And then at the very end of the volume, the um, the head key. 
one right, of them. Which, oh, yeah. Keys. Tease up head games the next volume. Head uh, games. The other thing that they're dealing with over the course of this is it turns out that Sam Lesser is actually in league with the lady in the well. She was the one that initially encouraged him to go and attack the Locke family, specifically to find out the location. And this is the mystery that they were starting to see it here. Uh, just find out the location of the Omega Key. And we don't find out what the Omega Key does yet. We find that out later on. Uh, but that's the big thing going on there. She also helps Sam Lesser break out of prison again and head back to a key house in order to once again attack the family and try to find the keys. Uh, only this time they beat Sam for good. And Sam ends up getting thrown through the ghost door, turned into a ghost and his body permanently dies at this point. And that's sort of where we end the volume. Uh, that, as I said, very broad strokes overview. Let's jump into specifics. Pete. Uh, yeah, I just wanted to say I did some research uh, after rereading it again before our, our podcast. And it turns out all wells are haunted. So stay away from oh. wells, I would just say. Oh, OK. Yeah. So you visited all wells or you looked up wells on Wikipedia? Yeah, I did some Googling on wells, and it turns out if you see a well, <laughs> it's most likely haunted. Um, uh, with wishes? I didn't get into specifics. Uh, okay, so the only <laughs> information you mean any specifics. Yeah, yeah no, nothing about water, nothing about wishes, just haunted. That's where wells yep. are at. Yeah. You might be thinking of graves, which is another <laughs> hole in the ground. Now... To start, uh, get away from this weird topic of conversation and instead uh, jump through uh, the book a little bit. Uh, we mentioned earlier that Gabriel Rodriguez is an architect, and I think I didn't realize that at the time. I found out he was an architect later, and fi looking up the information, actually doing some research for this podcast uh, and finding that out again. Why don't you brag was, about it? Dude, uh, I was struck flipping through the book and seeing how clear it is that he worked that into the book proper. And that's one of the reasons it's special. The very first page is a very well-structured door with a welcome mat uh, that I think shows off his architect's hand. And then later on, the very fact that Key House is so clearly well-drawn and well-planned out and structured, it makes it a better book because it doesn't feel like you're wandering through random rooms. It's you, He knows where the characters are in space at all times. Yeah, I mean, I think that's that's what's so amazing about this book and so unique, why it did so well and it continues to do so well, is it's so well thought out from the get-go, both on the right the writing side and the artist side. Uh, like, the, the Key House is a character in its own right, and so it's developed just as much as the uh, other main characters are in such a compelling way. And that this the first volume is all about introducing the house, I feel like, most of all. Because each character, each character gets their own book, but the house is the, the theme throughout. But also the, the way the uh, panels are laid out and the, the way it switches are, even in this first volume, to kind of give you that tease of, like, anything can happen. We can go in any direction. I mean, the fact that we got to see the kids drawing of what got him in trouble, and that was almost a whole page, and that told the story in itself. Uh, it's just amazing to let you know like how the storytelling can go anywhere and do anything. You're talking about the recap page from the beginning of the second issue, right, Pete? Yeah. Yeah. I love uh, it. Yeah, I think it, it's... There's... Rough start is the wrong word, but there's an interesting start that I did not remember at all to the first issue, where we actually don't even begin with any of the other main characters we discover later. It's actually Sam Lesser and his friend that are going and visiting the lock house. They see Nina Locke walk in. They've already uh, killed Sam Sam's uncle, I believe. Uh, and stolen his truck, and then we jump forward in time. And throughout the first issue... Sam's fact, father, I think. They, Sam's they father. Uh, and throughout the first issue, they keep jumping back and forth in time without a locator tag, which I think is a pretty ballsy thing to do. It's not like then, now, or anything yeah. like that. You're just able to... Well, th later on, there is a San Francisco now, uh, but even that... 
even San Francisco now is kind of like then a little bit because we yeah. flash through time throughout that sequence. And as I'm looking through the book here, I don't know about you guys, but I think the point that I realized this was something special is the page of Tyler waiting outside during his father's wake. Yeah. And it's one, two, three, four, five. It's 10, 12, I guess, repeating paddles that just show all of Tyler's friends going up to him one after another and sort of expressing sympathy in different ways while Tyler just sits on the bench. And it isn't until the very end when uh, his uncle Duncan approaches him uh, that he actually crumples and you get this very big panel of him falling down and sobbing and crying. Uh, it, it's so special. It's so emotional, but it's so specific to the character and confident in its stillness at the same time. Yeah, exactly. Like they could have just been like Tyler's depressed, but instead they go so far out of their way to just show it and it vis- both visually and the way it sort of feels when you feel like frozen out of because you're depressed or grieving or whatever um, you're feeling. And he's frozen in the panel while all these people just say nonsense around it. And then finally someone reaches him and he breaks down. And it's just such a great way to visually show what the character's going through. Yeah. Uh, the right weight. Out of the gate. Yeah. The weight of this uh, kind of funeral and this, the, the, the death and the way that they are kind of showing like how, how painful this is, is we don't, we're not flinching at all on what's, what this character is, is doing. And it is, uh, such a powerful way to show all those emotions. And, uh, it's just such amazing storytelling. Uh, Another thing that I think is really special about lock and key and the thing that makes it so successful to me. Uh, and I think to the three of us, because we ended up talking about pretty much every single issue on our live show as they came out is it's not, it's not as evident to the first issue, but as it goes along, even in the first volume, it's clear that they're aiming for the individual issue. Like structurally, this works, this volume works as one story. It's telling the story of Sam Lesser attacking this family and them ultimately resolving that conflict. But at the same time, East issue tells an individual part of that story that can exist on its own, that has its own dramatic arc. And that's something that's actually very rare in comics. Yeah. And especially taking the time for it to, very confidently go through each character in each of the siblings in each of the first three issues, Tyler, then uh, Bodie, and then Kinsey. And then we jump into the killer. Sam is that we get his backstory in the fourth Mm -hmm. issue. Like it's just, it's such an odd way or uh, surprising, but so compelling way to, to get into the story by seeing these different points of view and then watching it all come together. And also the fact that they have the confidence to introduce so many different elements there are the immediate threats, the ongoing threats, and basically the villain for the entire series in this first uh, couple issues. It's just, it's just great. Yeah, the pacing is really phenomenal. There's also a really good sense, and I know we're talking about the art quite a bit, but there's a really good sense of foreground and background. I'm just looking at a page here. Uh, there's a recurring visual riff of... Tyler looking into, I guess it's the stream outside of their house uh, and seeing his reflection, seeing himself in different ways. Is he a punk? Is he dead? Has he killed somebody with a gun? Because another thing that he's dealing with throughout is he very casually told Sam when he was mad at his father, he's uh, Sam said, you know, uh, sometimes I want to kill my dad. And Tyler tells Sam, oh, yeah, if you kill your dad, can you kill my dad, too? And Sam ultimately kills his dad. So Tyler blames himself. Uh, uh, just gets you. It does just get you. But uh, on this page, which I thought was kind of fascinating that I didn't really notice before is while Kinsey and Tyler are talking on the stream, the well house is in the foreground. They're asking where Bodhi is, uh, what's going on with Bodhi, what's been happening with him. There isn't a hand that pops out of Wellhouse or anything like that. Uh, but it's so clearly like there's this threat in the foreground, they're in the background, and they don't quite see it coming for them. Uh, and that's another thing that I think is really special with Gabriel Rodriguez's art. Yeah. Um, uh, one thing I wanted to say, uh, yeah. 
that this comic, despite it being like dealing with so many horror elements, like the first issue does such a good job of setting up so much tension in the present and then showing all the horror happening in in the past that happened in the past to mm-hmm. these characters, which I think is such a surprising way to do it. It would make almost more sense to show the murders and then show them moving to Key House. But instead you get both at the same time, which sort of makes the trauma more present in their lives, which is what informs so much of what these characters are going through. By the same same time they're going through all that, issue five has so many so much humor in it. Like humor like sad, like gallows humor where you have this sea captain who's like trying to light a cigarette and then a bus behind him explodes. Like it's funny at the same time it's horrifying. Yeah, I mean, that's one of the things that uh, I don't like horror, uh, you know, as a genre as much. Like, there's some stuff that I think is uh, really cool when it's trying to do stuff. But for me, what I really loved about this was the heart, the, like Justin was saying, the humor, the different emotions. There is hope. It It's, there is some a real, like, kind of, uh, uh, it's very unique and itself in a way that is just kind of you're drawn to it and you kind of can't look away. That also shows up at the end of the first issue when Bodhi eventually uses the ghost key for the first time, walks through and there's two pages where he figures out he's a ghost comes back in and brings his body back to life while there's a butterfly on it. And the idea of a seven, eight or nine year old kid or whatever he is being dead on the floor could be horrifying, like absolutely terrifying. Mm -hmm. But the position that he falls in, it's, it's a dark, it's a funny position. Like it's very clearly to make you realize, Oh, this isn't a terrible thing that's happening from his perspective. This is a fun thing. This is a cool thing. He gets to be a ghost. Isn't that awesome? And that says so much about Bodhi's character right there. Yeah, he's like a goofy look on his face. Yeah. Because he's playing. Now, uh, let me let me ask you a question. We also get to meet uh, Duncan a little bit in this volume. Uh, he's a character that... Um, not never quite works for me, but he always feels like an odd fit in the comic book in a yeah, certain way. He's just pretty chill. Yeah. He's like and a cool uncle. A, he is. He's uh uncle dunk. That's what I'm saying. Uncle, <laughs> uncle dunk. Dunkle. Yeah. Dunkle. Dunkle uncle. Uh, yeah. So uh, I don't know. Uh, but I think me, that's on purpose just to give him that extra edge. Wait, <laughs> Making him cool and chill gives him an edge? No, it makes him like the, you know, he doesn't seem like he fits. It's there's something like kind of uh, interesting about him. Instead of just having like a cool uncle or whatever, the fact that he f- doesn't feel like he fits is kind of cool. <laughs> I'm not quite sure I know what you're saying. <laughs> you're saying inherently uncles don't fit in and uncles are bad people. Right, no. Pete? No, no, I'm just saying just instead uncles of are bad. Like, like hey, any look uncle at this. any uncle on this podcast specifically is bad. <laughs> I'm just saying, like, I think it's a unique take to kind of have this showing him, but also showing him with the different layers that you know it's not everything's not simple in this book. By the way, Pete, you were working on that spec script for bad uncle, right? How's that going? Oh man, it's like bad Santa four. But it's about being an uncle. Oh, oh wow. Yeah. You yeah, skipped all the way over Bad Santa 3. That's how cool <laughs> that script is. Yeah. Well, we've all – that script leaked a while ago, so I feel like it's out there. So that's why we had to go with 4. Nice. And way to get rid of all the Santa stuff. Nobody Wait, liked I'm that sorry. part of it. I just, yeah. I just have to ask. There was actually a script for Bad Santa 3 that leaked? No. I don't think oh. so. I don't think oh, so, okay. Alex. If I could just read the situation. Yeah. I'm <laughs> no. just doing a bit. Oh, okay. I think it's uh, funnier saying Bad Santa 4 like they kept going with it. Oh, okay. <laughs> wow. <laughs> Talk about prep school. Alex just got schooled by, uh, <laughs> by Pete's sequel jumping bit. Yeah. Uh, so let's keep working through here because the second issue, we met the lady in the well a little bit in the toilet in the first issue, uh, but we get oh. to meet her proper in the second issue uh, when Bodhi goes to the well. At first, she thinks she's an echo in the well. Uh, what I think is a fascinating choice is to show us her in the well very quickly. 
Like there, there would be, I think, a choice to just leave her off screen as much as possible. But she's worked into it. We get to see her right in the second issue, her full body. Uh, we understand that she is not an echo, that she's a being. Uh, why do you think they made that choice? I think the way the story moves is developing these villains simultaneously. And then the reveal later is that they're working together. Uh, Mm -hmm. So I think they sort of had to had to move fast. And I think that goes back to they had such an understanding of what kind of story they wanted wanted to tell and the plot they wanted to just get to that. They were like, oh, no, we can't be coy about this. It's time to it's time to move. Yeah, Yeah, there's so much shit that goes down in this book. They were like, yeah, pay off on this probably won't be. Let's just show it because it's (laughs) it's creepy as well. It definitely is creepy. It's just uh, there's definitely different ways you can go in horror, uh, and they choose something different and interesting with the lady in the well. We're bouncing around her name a little bit because they don't mention it quite as of yet. Uh, But another thing that jumped out at me, and maybe you remember if this comes back because I'm holding off on reading the rest until we talk about them, Uh, but after Bodhi throws scissors in a mirror down the well— Freak me out, man. Well, and she's looking in the mirror and sees oh. this dead, decaying oh. skull face. Mm-hmm. That doesn't really come back, does it? I think so. Later, you realize, you, you get to see her true form oh, okay. by the end of the series, I think. All right. Okay, that was something I didn't remember, though. So if they did bring it back, that's awesome. Even if that they, they did, see though, them. just to sh- show sure. the, like you know, how dangerous she really is. Yeah, because yeah, she's absolutely. got a bad face. Um, another thing that they do really well <laughs> is what? <laughs> that's all, dude, Justin, that's just. That's what, I, well, that's what you were saying, though, right, no, Pete? No, that's not what I was saying. Oh, no. But just asking. the fact of like, oh, okay, scissors and a mirror, what horrible thing could happen from that? And we a get bad two haircut. horrible things. It could have been a bad haircut. Yeah. Yeah. What's worse than a bad haircut? Bad Santa 5, the script that I'm working (laughs) on right now. (laughs) Bad Hanukkah. Uh, The other thing that I noticed about this book as it went on is it starts off very bloody and violent, and then it starts being more judicious about it as it continues. And I think part of that is probably that they're trying to come out strong and grab you with the first issue. Grab your But you only get a little bit of blood... In particular, I think I think I'm looking at the second or third issue right now, the one where Sam breaks out of prison. There's mostly no blood all issue long up until Sam takes those scissors and ultimately stabs a guard so he can escape yeah. in prison and you get this double parade spread. And again, I think that's a very smart decision to jump out and do that, to hold back on it and use it for maximum effect. Yeah, I mean, this uh, this whole series is about tension and setting it up and not not paying it off for so long for all of the run of this book. And uh, they even set up a lot of the sort of legacy elements and the backstory things here that we don't see paid off for, you know, dozens of issues later when the this, this series isn't even really much of a horror at all. It's more of just a dark fantasy. Yeah. Uh, we also learn a little bit more about Kinsey as we go on. Yeah. Uh, what was your What was your first take on Kinsey as a character? Uh, I mean, it's they do such it's such a risk when they show her with um, sort of the the dreaded hair, and then later she's just normal. You jump back and forth between those two versions of her, and it's sort of a little confusing. But you realize in the issue that focuses on her that she made that choice. For a, a personal reason, she didn't want to have people feeling sorry for her, like she was making a a choice out of going through this trauma. And she's someone who has such an edge to her. But she, she, I, I love. I think, I think she's my favorite character uh, of the three siblings. Mm, why is that? Because she she feels the most uh, sort of going through it, like out there. She doesn't feel like she has to be the hero. She doesn't. She's sort of in the middle, just trying to get by. And I do like how, like her hair, uh, also kind of tells the story about how she's feeling and what she's kind of going through and stuff like that. Yeah, that's like you, Pete. Sometimes you have a beard. Sometimes you have a slightly bushier beard. Tells yeah. a story, man. 
Sure does, buddy. Yeah. <laughs> Wait, who's your favorite character in the book, Pete? And why is it Bodhi? <laughs> yeah. yeah, of the three siblings. Of the three siblings. Yeah, of the three siblings. Which is your favorite? I like the goon squad the most. Could you... What, what what are you talking about? Do you <laughs> like you Bodhi? Mean? Do you like Tyler? Or do you like Kinsey the best? And feel free to talk into your microphone while you tell us. <laughs> no, nah, I'm, I'm like looking down at the comic and ignoring that you guys are here. Yeah, that's know? great cool. for the audio podcast that we're doing. Just Bodhi, Kinsey, or Tyler. Just make a <laughs> so choice. What, what research do you need to do? Tyler's well, the big just, one. Bodhi's the kid. It's one yeah. of those things Wait, where I'm sorry, are you reading Lock and Key right now? Or are you reading the big book of Wells? <laughs> Dude, stay away from Wells. Why do you keep bringing Pete, you're up holding up a dinner menu for your local <laughs> pizza place. That's not Lock that and Key at all. Yeah. That's who that um, delight. <laughs> no, I just uh, I kind of get lost when I turn through the pages there. I I like Bodie and Tyler for different reasons, uh, but they're both, you know, so you at certain times my favorite. You don't have a favorite. OK, yeah. It's hard can to you choose, choose one? If you had to you choose know. one based on this first volume. Though. Right now. All right, I'm going Bodie then. Okay, okay. There it is. Then I'll choose Tyler. Nice. Cool. Because you love fishing lures. I do. I love hats. I love fishing lures. I love thinking I killed my dad. Yeah. All of that stuff. Oh, why? So t- tell us why, Alex. No, I do, I do like Bodie the best. I mean, I think Bodie is just the most <laughs> fun character in the book. His, he is the very, like, classic Amblin type character, like Goody's yeah. uh, E.T. type character, where he's the one who's like, let's go on an adventure, and everybody else is off on their own things, but he's the unifying ingredient yeah, that actually ties gets the family together. Exactly. He gets the mystery going. He's the one who is young enough to not just believe in magic, but also to try magic, and I love that. Yeah. Uh, and he's funny. Like he's a, he's a funny character. Kinsey is dealing with so much. Tyler is dealing with so much. Yeah, Bodhi Tyler, is the only one. Yeah, I like Tyler because uh, I think he's, he's just, he carries everything because he's the oldest. He's taking on a lot more responsibility and he's kind of also old enough to realize how fucked they are and how much trouble they're actually in. So he wears a lot of it. Plus he's kind of a big goon, which I appreciate. Yeah. Good squad. Another character that you should probably know about that we meet in this book, uh, and another thing that I think is so smart about what's done here that you mentioned earlier, Justin, is all of the characters that you meet tie in in some way. They don't have random characters who wander in and out. And here you meet Ellie Except Whedon. Except for Dr. Zalbin. He just wanders in and out for no reason. No, Dr. Zalbin is crucial. They're bringing back no. Lock and Key for World no. War Key. And I don't know. You need doctors at war. That's all I'm saying. No, he seemed very random of a character. I kind of wish they didn't have him in there. I'm just I honestly saying, don't like, even think you, he's a real doctor. If you, <laughs> if you had read the book, you would understand that Dr. Zalbin is, like Bodie, the unified character. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but we do get to meet Ellie Whedon, who is the gym teacher. We obviously find out that she's much more tied to this mystery than we thought by the end, and she is crucial going forward as well. Uh, but there's a big clue of the characters you should be paying attention to in a uh, portrait that she pulls out and takes a look oh, yeah. at about halfway through the Kinsey issue, where you get to see the Lovecraft senior drama, The Tempest, and the characters in it are Mark Cho, Mark Cho Lucas Caravaggio, Ellie Whedon, Rendell Locke, Kim Topher, and Aaron Voss, uh, as well as Joe Ridgway, who is the director and I believe now the principal of the school, um, but they're all important. They're all tied to each other. Uh, and it gives it just to tease it a little bit for those of you who haven't read the book or are potentially reading along with this podcast. It gives us this generational aspect to the book where things that happened to the past are reverberating on the future. Love it. I yeah. love how they set that up so early on and we don't even know how important it is at this point in the story. Yeah. Uh, Let's talk about the Sam flashback issue where we get to see how awful things are, not just for Sam in the present, where he's been forced to go down on truck drivers just to get back to Love House, not Love House, excuse me. uh, (laughs) (laughs) Wow. Alex, tell us more. 
Tell us your journey toward Love <laughs> House. Sorry, house. The Love House. Uh, great little Take the old place. To love House. That's what I always say. Uh, and we see he was beat up. He was bullied. He's clearly been damaged. Uh, but that doesn't justify anything that he did, right? Well, I think uh, yeah. you see, uh, you see um, the uh, Rendell Locke talk talk to him about how he likes him. He's trying to encourage him, but he's like, "You're having a a break with the society. Like you need you need help." And that's right, the turning point that pushes him sort of over the edge and sets up what we see in this in this issue, in this series. So it's a sad, it's a sad story, especially cause he's so smart. That's something they really hit on a number of times in this first arc. Like he's very smart, but unfortunately uh, too damaged to not be anything but a killer. Yeah. Yeah. You do you sympathize with him, Pete. No, I just think that it doesn't excuse anything that he's done is my point. Uh, what, being also, smart? we all know the smart ones in the groups are the psychopaths and the ones you have to watch. I'm I'll looking at you, kill you. I will I'm fucking at you. slit your neck, you son of a bitch. I knew it. We should do an IQ test to see who the real killer is. <laughs> That's a yeah. challenge. Whoever's got that high score. I'll huh? tell you what. Uh, three of us taking an IQ test, I see no reason that would go wrong. <laughs> <laughs> okay, on the oh, count of three, let's just say our SAT scores. <laughs> Since that's something that happens in this, it happens in the comic. Uh, I'm I feel sorry, like we we have to move on. We have to <laughs> <laughs> talk about other things at this point. Uh, uh, I do want stuff. to actually talk about this great sequence that happens—a flashback with Sam when he's in Rendell Locke's office and why Rendell is trying to get through to him and talk to him. The lady of the well is actually talking to Sam through a picture of Wellhouse so on Rendell Locke's yeah. wall. Uh, it's me. so cool, so creepy. We get to see her put right, help me and listen to echoes on the picture. One thing that I love about this is the art style is... Well, I guess the graining is totally different for the rest of the comic book. So it feels like even though it's black and white, it's popping out in a different way. Yeah, I feel like that is it reminds me of seeing something, a piece of art on someone's wall or something that really sticks out to you. It the way they did it, it just feels more like photorealistic than the other art in the comic. And I thought that was just very smartly done. Yeah, the the panel layouts and the shit everything is so thought about and so smart it's just uh, it's such a great glorious read i can't i can't get over it uh now you mentioned uh, this kicks off the fifth issue uh the sequence where sam finally does get to lovecraft he sets a bus on fire kills a guy at a boat uh and meanwhile Bodhi really kind of screws up, and we get the single most terrifying panel, I think, in the history of comics, I want to say. Uh, and I want to talk about, I want to get your opinions on why this is so terrifying, because all of us agree that this is a terrifying thing that happens. Uh, Bodhi is, over the course of two pages, clicking on a flashlight on the left oh. side of the page. He's turning the flashlight on and off, on and off. And we get to see the well, which we already know are very scary, uh, on the other side of the page. And then you flip the page. There's a panel of somebody yelling for Bodhi. I believe it's his mom. Oh, it's Kinsey, actually. He leans out, says, down here, Kinsey. And then we cut to a reverse panel of her saying, mom says 10 more minutes outside and then bed. And he says, OK. And the lady comes out of the well. So mm -hmm. what is it? Because I jumped the first time that I saw this. What is it that makes this so terrifying? Well, I think it's you can tell that Bodhi is bored because he's just kind of clicking his flashlight on and off. And we know what's in the well, so we know to be tense. But the fact that he is so relaxed when he's so close to danger is what makes it so tense. And then when you look away from the danger for a second, and it's that classic, like, look away, look back, they're, they're behind you. And uh, it's just done so well. Yeah, I think Pete's right. It's just like a classic, uh, that horror move of, like, look away and look back and the monster's right behind you. And that's really, it's deceptively hard to do that in comics, but they pull it off in this also, moment. Also, the fact that, like, 
they only give you like a couple of pages, but it feels like forever until you see back to what happened. And the fact that like the point of view is now changed where it's like she is above and he is below is just mm. uh, oh, so powerful as well. I think that's a really good point. I mean, definitely the change of perspective helps a lot. I also think taking two pages of build up because you think with the lights turning on and off of the well, that would be the point that something would come out, right? Like you yeah. see the very sort of flash thing comes closer, flash things comes closer, but it's the lack of anything coming out of the well that builds that tension over the course of those two pages before, as Pete mentioned, we finally do get that paddle reverse paddle reveal. And I think that's really apt as well in terms of the height differential. She's smaller in the paddle. Bodhi is closer and large, uh, but she is looming over him in a specific way. And the shading is such that it's scraggly hair, like a Sabara rig style thing, glowing eyes, the rest of the face is in shadow. It's, Really scary. Even knowing it's coming, it's so well done. And Alex, let's be clear: like that, that is out there, and that's coming for you. Oh yeah, <laughs> yeah. Oh cool. I'm gonna sleep really well tonight. Uh, You're gonna sleep really well. Oh no! Oh, oh, I'm gonna sleep no. well. Oh, I God. love wells. I love. <laughs> I love Don't water. I love getting water out of wells. Uh, the bucket. I love water coming out of a well bucket is the best tasting mm-hmm. water in the world. Uh, <laughs> uh, prove uh, me wrong. Quick, First uh, off, let's just stop break it playing down. with fire with the wells, man. Uh, All right? What is You've your favorite Batman. part of the well? The bucket, the top part of the well, or the interior of the well where the water is? I've been in wells. I've been under wells. I've been on top of wells, and I love the whole process. Wait, I love are you in, were you in Goonies? How are you in a well? Uh, you know, we've all, I grew up in the country. We've all been trapped in a well before. In our yeah, faithful Justin, dog. Justin's the well boy. You didn't know that? Yes, famously the well boy. Yeah, You're haunted, he was then. trapped in a well for uh, 18 years, I want to say. That is true. I grew up uh, in a well. <laughs> Went through pu- puberty in a well. No fun. Mm. Oh, wow. No fun. Yeah, don't check those wells with a black light. Know what I'm oh, talking about? Oh, come on, man. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, don't don't drink the water out of that. Oh, the well, boys, well. Uh, and then uh, we do get, which I also think helps build the tension so nicely. We see her come out of the well, and then it's several pages before we get back to that. Yeah. Which you're like, oh shit, what's going to happen to Bodie? No, just kidding. We're going back to Sam, killing the guy on the boat. Then Tyler is watching TV. Uh, and then we get a page of Kinsey talking to cops and the cops being like, okay, everything's fine here. Don't worry about it. We know Sam escaped from prison, but we're here to protect you. And that's when we get back to the real danger, a full page spread of the lady of the well holding down Bodie with her hand over his face going, shh. And ultimately what she wants is she says that your family's in danger. Uh, you got to help me. You got to get me. I think she's asking for the anywhere key, right? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, At which point Sam attacks. We go back to the home invasion. uh, And this stuff is great. Like just the action over the course of this issue, issue and a half or so, as Sam locks different members of the uh, Locke family inside the wine cellar. uh, Ironically. Yeah. Tortures Tyler. Uh, Bodhi is desperately trying to find the anywhere key. He discovers that it's odd Kinsey's bracelet, uh, by using the ghost key. Uh, he uh, very noticeably to us reading the comic book leaves the ghost key in the door, which sets up what happens to Sam later. Uh, but Sam and Tyler parry back and forth and Tyler gets that redemption he wanted, where he was not able to save his dad, but now finally he's able to take down Sam. And at the same time, Bodie makes the biggest mistake in the series, I think, where he hands the anywhere key to the lady in the well, and she immediately uses it to leave. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and, and then, then we, we set up, we set up like the next uh, multiple like problems for them that uh, Sam is a ghost haunting key house. Um, the, a uh, character that we will later know as know as Dodge um, is hanging out with them and is uh, a problem. And uh, Bodhi pulls the head key out of the the pond. 
Yeah, uh, you mentioned this earlier, but we do get to see. I think I think it is called the gender swap key. I'm not 100 percent sure, uh, but Dodge changes from the bullet in the well to a man named uh, Zach. Zach. Yep. Yeah, Zach, uh, and shows up as you said is friends with everybody, but he also is going to live with Ellie Whedon, and very casually was like, "Hey, you got to let me stay here." I mean, after all, I killed your mom for you. So there's a lot more going on with Zach, the Lady of the Well, than we know at the current time. Uh, such a great book. Yeah. So many amazing things going on. Was there anything that we missed talking about that you wanted to touch on? I think that's it. I mean, I do have uh, sort of a, a key moment I'd like to unlock here oh, in a boy. minute. <laughs> Ooh, is it time to do that? Is it time well, to? I don't know. Um, I, I would just like to say I was just really impressed with how much you got to spend on the different characters. Uh, it's just nice to be able to. They did a good job of grabbing your attention, but then kind of really getting into all the different characters. So you didn't have a lot of questions. You kind of had the answers moving forward. This is They weren't keeping a lot of stuff for you. They were giving you little breadcrumbs that you didn't realize was going to pay off. But it's just the design of it and the way that they kind of like thought about the whole story and how they were going to start with this first trade is unbelievable. Well, that's what you have to do with an indie comic series or really any comic book series. For those of you who don't regularly read comics, basically you have like one issue to grab people, and that's pretty much it. I mean, I think it's probably a little different for somebody like IDW that is able to foster and work with talent a little bit and give series a little more room to breathe. But even there, if your first issue doesn't have this big, bold idea and big story moments, big splash at the beginning and at the end, you're not going to keep people with it. And then if the second issue doesn't deliver the same thing, again, your story is going to fizzle because there's so many things on the stand and so many things that are jockeying for attention. So what they do here is, do they have a six-volume plan? Yes. Was this the end of the story? No. But at the same time, each issue, like we were mentioning earlier, feels like a complete meal when you're reading it. And these six issues, if for whatever reason they never published anything else, would still feel like a complete satisfying story. And I think that's very important. To, that's very calculated on their part to make sure people were sucked in because they weren't going to get to six volumes if they didn't completely wholeheartedly sell people on this first one. And now it's time for everybody's favorite part of the podcast. We're going to unlock some key moments, some yeah. of our favorite or most impactful moments of the book. I think we kind of talked about a lot of them in the preview episode, I'm going to guess, but let's do it anyway. Now, Justin, you were pretty jazzed to introduce your key moments, so why don't you, you jazz hands? I'm going to jazz hands my way through to my cuckoo key moment. Pew, pew, <laughs> unlocked. <laughs> Oh my uh, god! I, oh yeah, I, I did my own little theme for mine. So like, oh okay, like you guys can do that too, or do whatever you want. But that's just mine. Okay, okay. all right. Well, well, I won't do that riff, but maybe I'll do another riff. Yeah, no, do it. That's what I'm saying. Do whatever you want. This is your key moment, so it's your turn mm. to shine. Um, my key moment um, is the we talked about this a little bit that the fact that Bodhi gives away the anywhere key, releasing uh, the main what we will later realize is uh, sort of a main villain. Um, I love that the our main characters, our heroes, through their um, sort of mistakes and naivete, set up, create their own problem. That is my uh, favorite thing about the way this plot sort of hinges on itself and cuts back and forth. And they make these decisions in this first volume out of necessity, and it ends up being the thing that drives their story for the rest of the series. Nice. Pete, what about you? You want to unlock a key moment? Uh, yeah. So my, uh, Oh, I'm sorry. Were you going to do like a little riff thing before that? Oh, you just did. Yeah. That's yours. You just go. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. Hmm. Do you want one? I could do one for you. I could do like a, please go like Pete. Nope. Uh, so Pete, wow. Pete, why would you uh, think that that was a good idea? Key moments. Alex is having Peace. some sort of lung malady. Yeah. <laughs> wow. You couldn't be I more of a dad smoking. if you tried. Um, so I think that 
My key moment is the, uh, of course, the thing that we didn't talk about, but it's a huge moment, is the axe to the back of the head moment. Yeah. Um, nobody is safe. Uh, also, you know, just if you think somebody is like, you know, not capable of defending themselves, axe to the back of the head. Uh, this comic is insanely over the top and not afraid to take big swings, whether it's with the art or the violence or the storytelling. And I think that moment right there kind of lets you know that like, you know, pretty important people are going to get cut, you know, maybe cut in half with a double sided black ax, but you know, they're key to the story. Anybody you're referring to in particular, Pete? No, I'm just saying people get cut. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I'm ready to unlock my key moment. <laughs> Pete. That's my riff. Oh, wow. interesting. That's my riff now. <laughs> Sorry about that. So uh, awful. We actually talked about most of them, but I do think that sequence with Tyler at the wake or funeral or whatever it was uh, mm. is so good and so well paced out. And again, really just gives a visual and emotional statement for the entire book right in the first issue that feels so unique from anything else on the stands. And given that we... I don't know, I want to say still read 30 to 40 comics a week, that it still feels fresh and new reading it again at this point, uh, shows you how special and timeless this book really is. Yeah. Yeah. All right, a couple of things before we go. If you would like to support this podcast and other podcasts, we do patreon.com slash comic book club. Also, we do a live show every Tuesday night at 7 p.m. at the People's Improv Theater Loft in New York. Come on by, and we will definitely chat with you about lock and key. Uh, now, we should mention we're going to be doing the next volume, Head Games, a week from now. Uh, so make sure to read it and then come back here. Also, subscribe to the podcast. It's now available everywhere on iTunes, Android, Spotify, Stitcher, or the app of your choice. Uh, and you can get it there. You can also follow us socially, Watch Wim Watch Pod, on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. So check out stuff there. And uh, let's do a sign-off, which is, of course, lock it up, y'all. Oh, my God. No? Yep, that's it. That's it from is now it? on. Oh, or we could all make, oh, I know, we should do our usual sign-off where on the count of three we say our SAT scores. <laughs> <laughs> okay, one, two, three. <laughs>